Take that chair over there, there, and I'll take the other chair. Sure. All right. Sit Why down. don't I sit over here? Look out. Yeah. Uh, this is yeah. well, this is fun. just ours, and if that's you need it or want to call on it, it's well, available. that's what we're going to do. We're going to get the transcript. What we'd like to do, Mr. President, is get this is our outlook issue, our main issue of the year. Six foreign policy questions in order. Let's go down them. Uh, first, for example, of the year ahead. Uh, how do you propose to rebuild a working relationship with the Soviet Union and revive uh, meaningful, meaningful arms control? Well, I think we can do it because I think, frankly, uh, those negotiations in are as much value as the Soviet Union. They aren't to anyone else. Probably even more important. And I have to point out that all this talk about the Supposed strain in relations. Um, can people look where there's almost an inference, or there is an inference, that um, somehow it's laid a couple. But we didn't kill some Russian citizens by shooting down a civilian airplane. Uh, we are not attempting to conquer an adjacent country to ours. The, and we didn't walk out negotiations and not give a date for when they would resume. Uh, if there is a strain, it, uh, it has not been caused by us or anything we're doing. Just the absence of, of uh, Andre Puff from the picture where under certain circumstances you might have been able to have meaningful exchange of correspondence with him is affecting this relationship? Well, I still think we can. We're going to do everything we can to continue to deal with them and resolve any problems between us. And I think the, the biggest problem is peace and war. And I think, I don't think they want a confrontation any more than we do. But the great, the accidental possibility that hangs over the world when there's this much nuclear power on tap in the world and aimed across the oceans at each other, we're going to and are willing, we'll be at that table when they decide to come back, but to negotiate in good faith. We have never broken off uh, communication with them. We have, at several levels, uh, continued uh, to meet with them, and we're ready. And I, I know the absence of Andropov has, uh, must have had it on their side on what could be done. But I believe that that the Soviet Union has more to gain than we or anyone else does in taking a look at changing the situation and in effect then joining the family of nations. Uh, the way the rest of us are as trading partners, as uh, all concerned with peace. And this is this is what we're extending what we're out to. Yeah. Joe, could question we, number two. Yeah, could we ask about the Middle East? And I think the main concern is about Lebanon. Do you think in 1984 it's going to be possible to withdraw the Marines? And will it be feasible to do that only if and when a stable government is able to unify that country? Is that the only circumstances in which you see them being withdrawn? Well, yes. And it goes for not only our Marines, the whole Mullah National Force. The Mullah National Force is there for one reason. The it was a part of, of course, our whole idea of bringing peace generally in the Middle East area or helping trying to get people to kind of go between to bring these nations together. But there was Lebanon in the way, and if you remember at that time, Beirut itself being shelled from every direction. They had asked the, uh, the Syrians to come in and help keep order in a positive way because the government of Lebanon was virtually non-existent and powerless to do anything about it. Uh, the multinational force uh, in areas where it was the control of the Israelis. But the thing now is the change in Syria's position that even after a request from the Lebanese government to withdraw, they have refused. And they're still there. Now, we believe that the, 
purpose was of the multinational force, with the withdrawal of the other foreign powers, and then the bringing about of a Lebanese government, which has been created, uh, the reinstituting of the Lebanese armed forces, and we have done a, a fine job of training there and equipping. They have a good and a solid force. Maybe it needs to be some bigger than it is, but it, it is a, a good and a well-trained force and it's behaved, performed well. The idea then was that the multinational force as the other force left, and as the Lebanese moved out toward their borders to reinstitute control and stop the international fight that was going on, was that the multinational force would be behind, and in areas like Beirut, kind of maintain some order because the Lebanese military couldn't do both. And this is still the goal. And I think with all that's happening, we're overlooking uh, some of the progress that's been made. Now, all of the people, even those that are presently hostile at Geneva, all agreed to recognize the Jemaya government as the government, legitimate government of, of Lebanon. So that progress has been made. Uh, as I say, we've, the, their military has been brought up to a capability it did not have before. And I think progress has been made that we can look forward to this, but it now hinges on particularly uh, Syria is the stumbling block in its refusal now, after it had once agreed to leave and said that if Israel left, it would leave. And I don't say that the multinational force has to stay till all those forces are out. I think that even if it was assured that they that they all right, given assurance and they're going to go, start the process, I think we would do the same thing. Mm. Question three, and this is related to some extent, with the prospect of continuing terrorism, terrorist attacks, how can the United States respond, particularly when such attacks are, are inspired or sponsored by governments? Well, one of the hardest things, of course, is to prove that they're sponsored by a government. For example, these groups that are taking credit now that have the Iranian connection, well, there is a faction of Iranians that believe in a holy war. Uh, do we have the evidence that the Khomeini has spoken a number of times about advocating a holy war in the whole Muslim world to come back to his type of fundamentalism? So it's hard not to believe that he must in some way instigate or at least to, uh, edge on uh, those that are doing these things. But as for terrorism, the, the importance is not uh, to be uh, turned back by it. It is a worldwide threat, as we know. We, the threat is right here in our own country. It's, it's every place in the world. Uh, uh, I said the other day, and I believe this, that one of the things that can establish uh, government's responsibilities is if terrorists are claiming uh, triumphs when they do these uh, terrible deeds and acknowledging what their goal is and that they then have a connection with some country, then I think it's up to the government of that country to join in trying to curb and control that. If some of our own terrorist groups, such as just bombed a uh, recruiting station, uh, if they were, if they're not, that's our responsibility to corral them and find out who and what they are and bring them to justice. Well, the same is true for, for all the other countries. But the one thing we can do is what so many people, and even here in our own country, are advocating in the face of the terrorist attacks against our forces uh, in Lebanon, is, well, come home. Well, if terrorism can succeed in its goals, then the world is going to find itself under the control of the terrorists. You have to stand against that and not let it succeed. But what do you do if the government <clears throat> the government is actually responsible, as you say, possibly for instigating it, and you establish that? You can't ask that kind of a government to assume responsibility for controlling its territory. No, but then in those cases, I think that the world, the civilized world, has to uh, 
get together and see what action they can take. And uh, this does not necessarily mean warlike action, but uh, those things, that those pressures that can be put on a government to say, you start taking some steps to control this, or you will be a little outlawed in the rest of the world. Can, so why don't you go on can I just go on? on you're, you're going to China in the spring. I just wonder what, in your view, is going to be necessary to develop closer relations with China, particularly in the strategic field, and do U.S. ties with Taiwan, in your view, inhibit that process? No, I don't think they do. Uh, I know that the People's Republic, uh, their government figures are uh, they're uncomfortable with this position of ours, but we have reiterated time and time again to them that uh, this is a long-time friend, this is a country that's an ally uh, of ours. These people were, and while we have never made any claim that uh, we have recognized that there are two claimants to the government of China, and that is up for them to peacefully negotiate, we can't cast aside one friend in order to make another. And we have proposed the argument to the People's Republic representatives that they themselves should take some comfort from that because it's assurance to them that we wouldn't throw them aside uh, to make friends with someone else. I think we've made great progress. I know that sometimes they have to speak out about this other issue. But uh, our trade relations, the very thing of extension now, the area of high tech, all of these things represent milestones and successive steps in improving our relations. And now with the head of their government coming here, and I am going there in the spring, after he made his visit here, uh, we're going to find uh, those other areas where we can uh, improve and increase our relationship, cultural exchanges, things of that kind. Uh, all of this, I think, is on a on a good track, and, and it's been we've made we've made some gains. Good. Fifth question: What strategy does the administration intend to pursue in Central America? Let me just flesh it out. Is it to underwrite uh, the government of El Salvador indefinitely, and in Nicaragua to settle for nothing less than the overthrow of the Sandinistas? Well, our policy in Central America is regional. And this is very much what the Contadora process is. We're supportive of their efforts and what they're trying to do. Now, the El Salvador government. Here is, for literally the first time in 400 years, a government that is trying to achieve democratic ideals and practices and policies. They're beset by Cuban and Soviet-backed insurgents who don't want that kind of a government. Uh, they want the old-fashioned idea that we've seen for the last few hundred years, and that is, if you have a revolution, uh, it only is to exchange one set of rulers for another set of rulers. And for once, we've got a government there that says, no, this is to be a revolution to change this type of government. But at the same time that they're fighting against this potent enemy, they're being harassed from behind by right-wingers who want to go back to the old concept of government over the people, not by the people. So the government itself, we shouldn't be blaming that government for not being able to deal effectively with these rightists when they're beset by this other force. I think that the thing that is dragging this out, frankly, are the limitations placed on our aid by the Congress. It's almost as if they're saying, well, we'll give you just enough to let them bleed to death slowly. What we really need, and three-fourths of our aid is economic and social reforms, and the other 25 cents out of each dollar is for the military aid. What we need is the kind of aid to let them accomplish the job and eliminate this left-wing guerrilla force that is the principal enemy attacking them, and at the same time, find out wherever we can and point to these behind-the-scenes things that are happening from the right and where they need help in how to deal with this, that we should help them in dealing with that. And this was one of the missions that the Vice President performed when he was there this last time. And I think some progress is, has been made in with that regard. But we shouldn't let those rightists keep us from doing 
what is necessary to do in ending the war that's going on. That's for El Salvador. Now, Nicaragua, no, it doesn't take the overthrow of that government. All they would have to do is go back to the 1979 promises they made when this government put hands off of Somoza and let them go and then began to support them with financial aid until, and this was prior to our coming here, until they found out that one faction of the revolutionaries was exiling or imprisoning the, their partners in the revolution who were more democratic and intended to have a totalitarian form of government. Now their promises of human rights, of democratic principles, of free elections, of union rights and so forth, all of those promises were made in writing to the Organization of American States when they persuaded the Organization of American States during the revolution to persuade Somoza to resign, which he did. And they have not kept that contract. Uh, Nicaragua could uh, solve their problem right now. Some of the leaders of the Contras who are fighting them were leaders alongside of them in the revolution. And then were ousted, just as Castro ousted the same kind of people and imprisoned some of the best lieutenants he had because they wouldn't go along with him into a communist totalitarian form of government. Well, if this Nicaraguan government wants to go back to the promises of the revolution, we just have been in help. Thank you, Lock. Our time is up. We'll get the, we'll get you the sixth question sometime during the campaign, sir. <laughs> the sixth question, just <laughs> well, we're talking. Right, we about want to ask that. you about the, the use of power. The other night, you made. I think you might want to comment on. You spoke the end of our days of weakness, rebuilding of our military power, and I'm just wondering how you envisage the use of military power in pursuit of foreign policy. You know, there's a lot of a lot of controversy over this. I think that mainly what we're talking about is uh, deterrence. I have always believed, and in fact, uh, the Chinese had this idea thousands of years ago, that uh, your army is really doing its job if it never has to fight. And that's what we should have. And uh, I've viewed it in that standpoint. I think the only reason that the Soviets came to the table to discuss arms reductions in the first place was because they saw finally after years and years of unilateral disarming on our side, us canceling weapon systems and so forth for domestic political reasons, they didn't have to give anything up. Then when they saw us doing it, I think it was all explained in a cartoon, my favorite cartoon. And it was the cartoon that had Brezhnev when he was still alive and the head of government talking to a Russian general. And he said, I liked the arms race better when we were the only ones in it. And uh, when they found out they weren't the only <coughs> ones in it, that in other words, we'll do whatever is necessary to make it evident that hostile moves on their part uh, would result uh, in equal or greater punishment to them. That's the purpose of our, our military buildup. And uh, it certainly worked in Grenada. <laughs> <laughs> we did get the six. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Feel good. Thanks for having us.